this presentation, you will learn why you should start with PowerPoint for your newsletters, flyers, and signs, and how to prepare the flyer to use across all the different media that you might want to use. Got to find the camera. There we go. And that includes the email viewing screen. And it seems like they wouldn't work together very well, but honestly, PowerPoint is the best choice that you have as an ordinary human being that doesn't have Adobe Illustrator or, Power, or Photoshop or those things. There are better, more expensive options, but PowerPoint is something that comes with your Microsoft Word. You probably never thought about using it this way, and I'd really like you to start thinking about that. This is our poster from this year's District 15 conference. Time for Toastmasters. It was done in Illustrator and in uh, Photoshop, both Adobe products. And it was done by, dang it, Jack C. High person. You guys help me with the name. DJ. Thank you, DJ. DJ did it. He did a wonderful job. But it was kind of limited. In the first place, the fonts that are being used, that's the letters and the wording, uh, were unique to not just to Illustrator and Adobe products, but actually to the Macintosh version. So that makes it very difficult to move those information over to other things. But what I wanted you to see is that even though he did this poster in that program, he was still able to send me an image of it, which I can still print out in PowerPoint. So in PowerPoint, which you're seeing it here, I took an image of the Time for Toastmasters, and you click on the area that says slide size, and you go to portrait, and you choose custom, and it can be an 11 by 17. That's a tabloid size. There are many printers that can handle that and many copiers. You can go to 12 to 18 if you go to a FedEx office or something like that. But if you want to go any bigger, this actual program can do banners. It can do 20 feet by 30 feet if you want to do a billboard. It will do whatever you need it to as far as being able to handle the information data per pixels per square inch and all of that that you would need to have. Let's see how we used it also. I took the bottom part of DJ's Time for Toastmasters and cut it off and I wanted to make a, an email that I could put out to everyone so that they would be able to be reminded that our conference was coming up. And I wanted it to show up right when they opened their email. I didn't want them to have to click on a PDF in order to open it. That's important because most people won't click. On the other hand, you have to also attach a PDF because some people use different systems than Microsoft Windows and Apple. I think Dan could probably tell us all about how not to get to see pictures when they come in your email. And so if you're going to send them, you always have to double, double duty. But I want you to see how little information there is this is 900 pixels across. 900 is a little bit big, but as computers get better, it used to be a 600. And for engineers, 450 to 500, if you wanted them to be able to read it. I started working on the computer websites in 1989. And so as you can imagine, in 1989, there wasn't much that you could do. It was very limited by what was available. Anyway, this is what we got. Now, I want you to notice too that because this is 
an image, people would not be able to click on those Zoom information on the top and on the bottom. So if you're going to do something like that, you have to put that part into the actual email line where you're writing everything down. Okay. So that just takes us across things. Now let's look at newsletters. I've been doing the District 15 Speaks newsletter. It's much too complicated to do as images that are going to be seen only on email. So I do it in PowerPoint, and I'll tell you why about that in a minute, because it's going to be on paper, because it has layers, and because I want it to be easy for me to manipulate. This is a version of it that I cut off in order to send out for people to give me articles. So this is an image that was also taken from PowerPoint. You can't click on it, but that part, the am at district15speaks.org, I would have in the regular email portion, and this would pop up as, the, as a picture right under that link. I think that's the only negative thing. I'm sure I've lost you all by now. Hang in there with me. Okay, why do I like PowerPoint? Keeping in mind we're using PowerPoint that I'm showing you this in. This image right here, oh shoot, I can move it, yay. That's great. See, this is the logo for the tribes and it's round. And they, it wasn't round when I got it, it was square and it had this black area here. So I needed to remove background. In PowerPoint, you can remove backgrounds. So you really can't do that in Microsoft Word. And it is so slick that it makes so many more options available to you as you try to put illustrations in the things that you're doing. Now let's put an illustration into Word. It takes six steps. I'm not going to go through each one of them with you. I just wanted you to see what a pain in the butt it was. So you have to open your Word, get your picture, then you have to tell it not to be connected to a paragraph and words because then it'll keep moving. Every time you add a word, every time you change something, your picture ends up somewhere else. It's very difficult to work with. So you then have to right click on it. You get this little box here and you pick the layout that is um, with text wrapping and fix the position on the page and there you go. It's done. It was only six steps. Let's take a look at it in PowerPoint. Oops. Two steps. It's two steps in PowerPoint. And the reason being is that you have a text box that you had to add in PowerPoint to get your text. In Word, the text box is embedded in it. And you have to fight that text box at all times. So in this particular case, I have three text boxes, two text boxes here, and have my text in it. I dropped my image right in, and I don't have to fight with anything. And I can move any of them. I have them grouped together right now. So I can group them and move them all. Um, oh, I guess that's the background. I'll not move that. But I can move this as I need to. So it makes it much easier to get anything where you need it to go when you're doing it in PowerPoint. Let me move that back. Next. Remind me not to hit save when I get out of it because I wouldn't want to save the one that's messy. Okay, another reason, here's something that you need to know if you're making newsletters or you're making flyers or you're making posters, anything. Why do we care what type of an image it is? We care because a ping has a transparent channel. All things are square until pixels change their shape. I always thought they should be circular or hexagonal, something. But until they change their shape, everything is square. 
So in this Toastmaster logo that we want to see the space in behind it, we have to choose a ping because that space is actually there. There's a little piece of information for each spot in that empty space, but it's transparent. And that makes it so that we can put things right next to it. This is what it looks like as a JPEG. You'll see that you can't unsquare it. You can't transparent the white. But more importantly is if you want to put those fancy sh um, shadows. Shadows make everything look great. It gives it real punch. So if you've got a ping, you get the shadow right around all the edges. And if you've got a JPEG, it goes around the square, which is not attractive in the least. Another reason you'd want to use a ping, even in Microsoft Word, is that this Im image was taken from Microsoft Word with the ping uh, being able to be wrapped around closely. So that's something you can do that you wouldn't be able to do if this Toastmasters logo was a JPEG. So even in, even in Microsoft Word, a ping is important, more important than using a JPEG. Here are, some I, here are some examples of something that I call overlay or layering. Nobody makes pictures anymore that are just a photo and then some words under it and another photo and words under it. No, nope, everything's all mixed up now. We have text that's right on top of the background. We, often, we have text with shadow that's on the background. And there's these three things I wanted you to consider because this one here, the ECOGS, you can't use that online. You can't read it. It will become blurry as you try to. The text is going to be too small. Even if you blow it up and make people scroll through it, it's going to be a pain. Whereas if you drop down on the data, you can use this. I'd still do this in PowerPoint because I can still print this out at three feet by two feet. And it's pretty quick and slick and works well. Okay, I'm not going to go through the next ones because it's just more examples of layering. But I want you to also see that when I'm going to do a newsletter, I go online and steal ideas. Perfectly good. You do that too and you'll see all of this overlay that everyone's doing. It'll change, five years it'll be something very different. This is my ending slide. It has nothing to do with my presentation, but while I was working on my presentation, I found it, it's the coolest thing ever, the periodic table of content marketing. What happened was I was trying to remember what the difference between a format and a platform was. So this is by this dude down here, Chris Lake. He's in England or Australia, and he made this wonderful uh, seven-step guide to content marketing. So it explains everything from format to platform to your checklist to everything you'd have to think about when you're taking information and divulging it to the world. So that's free. That's your goodie to take home with in your goodie box today. And it's in the slideshow that I put in the chat box. And that's about it. So I am going to, so in the, in the one that you'll get that's a PDF, there are step-by-step -step instructions on how to put an image in Word and an image in PowerPoint so that you'll have that in case you wanted to. But now I'm going to stop my share.